So welcome back to the afternoon session. Now we have the pleasure to welcome Professor Rui Loja Fernandes from uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And he's going to talk about Bachner-Keller structures after Robert Bryant. OK. Thank you very much for the invitation. Being Portuguese, it's always a great pleasure to come to Brazil. Um, so as someone mentioned this morning, these were supposed to be more of a overview kind of talk. So what I'm going to try to do is a, a mixture of things. Um, I'm going to try to tell you about some things that have been going on, on a, for the last 15, 20, 20 years um, in some kind of extended uh, leaf theory, uh, but in a concrete uh, application to classification problems in differential geometry of a certain kind. And so most of the time I'll be concentrating on the problem of classification bochner keller matrix uh, to illustrate these points of view. Um, but at some point, things will become a little bit too complicated, so I will derive to other things. Uh, I should say that my, my job is a little bit complicated, because imagine that you've never heard about what, a, what is a Lie group or a Lie algebra, and you wanted to tell people about what is a Lie group and what is a Lie algebra, and some results about them and some applications of them. So I'm kind of in the same, in a similar situation as that. Uh, all right, but let's, let's give it a try. Um, so basically this is based uh, on some joint work with uh, Ivan Strukiner, who is from here, from USP, and uh, it builds on this paper of Bryant um, where he, he classifies, uh, in some sense, bochner keller metrics. Um, so I already told you more or less what is my aim. Uh, there will be kind of four parts in this talk. Uh, so the first part, I will recall what is a bochner keller metric, and then I'll slowly build into the classifications and explain how these uh, extended Lie theory enter into the picture. And uh, um, the fourth part, I will come back to the classification issues. All right, so I start with a Keller manifold. So my notation, I have a, a metric G, a complex structure J, and the symplectic form omega, and the curvature tensor R. Uh, and we form the usual quantities by taking traces. So we have the Rishi tensor, the holomorphic sectional curvature, the scalar curvature, and the traceless Rishi tensor. And because we are in the Keller setup, things simplify a little bit by taking special orthonormal bases. Now, uh, the curvature tensor has the usual symmetries. And besides, because we have the, the Keller structure, it also has the symmetries relative to the complex structure. And um, if we pick all tensors that satisfies these symmetries, and we consider the action of UN on them, we, can we, we get a representation of UN, which we can decompose into irreducible factors. And this gives us a decomposition of the curvature into three terms. So the first term there uh, can be thought as if you start with a Keller metric and some scalar S, you can build a tensor out of them that will satisfy all those symmetries, and which is uh, written there. Um, and uh, so in the end, uh, a, matri uh, a metric which has R0 equal to 0 will be a scalar flat uh, metric. And it will, uh, a metric will have only R0 if it has constant holomorphic scalar curvature. So that gives you an idea of what that first term is. Now for the second term, you can actually pick this expression and start replacing one of the Gs by a traceless ten symmetric tensor S, and we get a new expression that, uh, that also satisfies those symmetries. And uh, this expression has the particularity that its trace is this tensor S that we picked. And uh, in the end, we'll see that uh, for a Keller metric, this R1 will be zero precisely if the metric is Keller Einstein. And finally, we have the last tensor. And the last tensor is simply subtract from R, R1 and R0 and R1. 
And so in the end, R0 represents basically the scalar curvature, R1 represents the traceless Ricci tensor, and the remaining part is called the Bogner tensor. So, uh, a Bogner, uh, a Bogner keller manifold will be one for which the Bogner tensor vanishes. And so that means the curvature is, all, is, is, is expressed, if you want, only in terms of the Ricci tensor. That's, that's what the bochner keller uh, metric is. All right. So examples of these are not that many. They were actually quite scarce, uh, quite a few examples until this paper of Bryant appeared and clarify a bit the issue. So we have complex projective space uh, with some constant holomorphic sectional curvature. Or we can take a product of two of them. Uh, provided we, we, we pick the, 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 the sectional curvatures appropriately. Um, if we take a locally symmetric space and we ask if it is a bochner keller you'll see the only example is actually that, or, of course, uh, open sets in there. So they are locally isomorphic to that. Or if we take CN and we write uh, the potential and we look for the the condition on the potential for which the metric becomes bochner keller then we get an ODE, which is written there for some constants A and K, and then you can try to find solutions of that ODE and produce some examples that are not very illuminating, and it turns out that up to scalar multiples, there is exactly one complete such example. And then there is also Orbifold solutions, for example, weighted uh, projective spaces. And that will be able to actually turn out to be important uh, later. All right. Now, so how, how does one find more examples? How does one find examples of these things? Well, there is the, the usual uh, differential analysis that one can proceed and then try to somehow solve the equations. So let's go a little bit through that. So suppose I have my bochner keller manifold and I look at its unitary frame bundle. Then I have the connection one form for the levi civita connection, and I have the tautological one form. Now, of course, these satisfy the usual structure equations, and they form a co-frame on the unitary frame bundle. Now, in this, um, using the, the bochner keller condition, one sees that one can express the curvature in terms of some function that takes values in Hermitian symmetric matrices. So that's the expression of the curvature for some uh, yet to be determined function S. All right? Now we can continue and we can, well, since D square is zero, we can differentiate this equation and that will amount to differentiate this and there will be some derivatives of S. And if we do that, so the first thing that we obtain is that the differential of S is expressed in this way for some new function T which now is a function takes values in CN. And now if we differentiate again, this function T has differential, uh, an expression where it appears again a new function U, which now takes values in R. And finally, if we differentiate U, this thing closes, which is very nice. And in general, that will not happen. So that, the, the word finite type that appear uh, in the first slide has to do with that, has the fact that this has closed and stopped there. So, so these functions uh, provide what's called a complete set of invariants, um, and let's put that aside for now. The point is that we have some equations that need to be satisfied, right? So we have the, on the previous slide these structure equations, and now we have these equations for these invariants, and we, any bochner keller uh, manifold will have to have these, will have to satisfy these equations. So, if I would like to find all possible uh, Keller structures uh, metrics, what would I have to do? Well, I could start to look for a manifold P with a free action of UN, carrying some co-frame, eta and eta, and some functions such that they would satisfy this system that we've just discussed. So that's it. That's what you have to do. Now, the point is, how do you do such a thing? How do you solve such a system? 
So, uh, and, and of course the reason is if we, if we do that, then this will be, a pre this, this P that, that we have here will be the unitary frame bundle of some Kähler, the Buchner Kähler metric, all right? So the question is how do we solve that? And so that's, that's what I want to, to explain. So um, there is a way of looking at these kind of uh, problems. Now, because this system is relatively complicated and in order to explain all the Lie theory and then explain you how to solve it and then come back to this will be a little bit too much. Here is another similar problem, which is kind of a toy problem. It's not a very serious problem, um, which is the following. So before, uh, so now I have, I ask for the following. I want to find all manifold, all three manifolds P with a free action of SO2, a co-frame, and some functions for which this kind of structure equations are satisfied. And it turns out that if you, if you do that, then this P will be the, frame, the orthogonal frame bundle of a surface with a metric G that satisfies this equation. So the Gaussian curvature has Eschen proportional to the metric. And this is an if and only if. So any surface who has a metric which satisfies this equation, which we call a metric of Eschen type, will be will arise from solving this. So this is exactly the same flavor as before. We have to find a manifold with a free action, co-frame, some functions satisfying the same, this kind of system, All right? Okay. So these two uh, problems and similar problems, sim similar classification problems can be abstracted into a setup, which is the following. So one starts with uh, what's called Cartan data. So one has a closed subgroup of GLN, uh, G manifold X, and some equivariant maps C and R. Uh, so these are maps define it on uh, X, this G manifold X, and which takes values in these uh, two things, which is exactly the, well, let's move on and we'll come back to that. And um, an equivariant vector bundle map, which takes values in, in the, the tangent to, to my x, my manifold x. Now, when asked for the existence, so this is the data, and then one has to solve a problem. And the problem is this. I need to find a principal G bundle with a co-frame and some equivariant map from this principal bundle back to x for which these equations are satisfied. So you see here that what I did was I abstracted two terms. So in the previous two problems, this term did not appear because the connection was always the levi civita connection, which has zero torsion. If you take a problem where the connections are not torsionless, then this term will appear. And then we have the curvature, and then we have these expressions for H. So what is H? Well, H is, in the previous slides, this set of invariants that we had in the case of buchner kähler was this function S, T, and U. And uh, so the, the two problems that I told you before is exactly this form, right? So this abstracts what we had for buchner kähler and what we had for this matrix of Eschen type, okay? And so the, the question is, I give you this data, how do we find, how do we solve, how do we show that some realization exists or how do we find explicitly these realizations? All right, so if we do that, of course, then the quotient of my P by this action of G will be a manifold, and P will turn out to be the G structure over this. All right, so I was saying that if you solve this, then you get the G structure over the manifold P, over the manifold M, which is the quotient of P by the free action of G, uh, which carries a connection and the tautological one form which satisfies these structural equations and which has this function f as the invariant, okay? All right, but still, okay, I just told you how to abstract the two problems into some abstract formulation. How do we actually 
find this principal G bundle P. Right? Now, uh, this way of formulating the problem is a little bit uh, annoying because we are looking for a manifold and a co-frame, and these equations involve the things that we are looking for. So I'm going to twist this a little bit, and I'm going to take this data, and I'm going to encode it in some different geometric way, which turned out to be useful. But before uh, doing that, just to make sure that uh, I don't lose you, so here is the data for the problems that I told you before. So in the case of the bochner kähler the x is, the, set of val is the, the possible set of values of these functions, s, t, and u. So this was a skewer emission. This took values in c, n. This took values in r. So that's the x. The g, of course, is u, n. It acts on x diagonally by acting by conjugation on the matrices and by the defining action on CN, trivially on R. And then these are the expressions that you get from the equations that I wrote before for the R, for the F, and the C is zero since there is no torsion. Okay, so it's some complicated uh, things, some functions. And so the, the classification of bochner keller metrics amounts to the solving this Cartan realization problem. That's what I told you before. In the case of the metrics of Hessian type, the x will be R3, so the direct sum of SO2 with R2. The g, again, will act diagonally, acting trivially on SO2 and by the defining action on R2. And these are the expression for the, the curvature viewed in this way. It's just very simple in this case. And the function f is written there more or less explicitly. Okay. So this is much simpler than the other one, and that's the reason why I'm mentioning it, so that I can show you a couple of things later. Explicitly. All right. So the classification of surfaces of Hessian type, again, solving this Cartan realization problem. All right, so I told you that what we are going to do is going to turn this a little bit around, and we are going to encode this Cartan data in a geometric way. So here is what we do. So we build a vector bundle, which is just trivial as a bundle. It just says fiber Rn plus the Lie algebra G. So in the case of bochner kähler this would be Cn plus Un, okay? And um, we built um, a bundle map from this bundle into the tangent to x, which puts together the, the function f that collects the invariant and the infinitesimal action of g on x. Remember, x comes with, infinitesimal, with an action of the group g, so I take the infinitesimal version of it. The Lie algebra action is this psi. And uh, besides this bundle map, there is a bracket where I put the torsion and the curvature. So this is a bracket on the sections. This is the expression for the bracket on constant sections. So I'm taking here u, uh, if you want, a constant. So an R, uh, a vector in Rn, alpha, an element of g. And this means that because g is always contained, is a Lie algebra of endomorphisms, the group g was in GL. g is in Lie algebra of endomorphisms of Rn. So this is the, the action of an element of the Lie algebra on a vector v, I skew symmetrize, I have here the, um, the C that expresses the torsion, and here I have the Lie bracket on G and the curvature, okay? And that gives me a skew symmetric bracket on the sections of this vector bundle A. Uh, it's only defined there on, on constant sections, but then I extend it to any sections by requiring a Leibniz type identity. So if I multiply a function by a, a section by a function, the function comes out, and then there is another term where the first section acts on the function by first turning that section into a vector field using this bundle map. So this uniquely determines uh, a Lie bra uh, sorry, a bracket on the space of sections. So that encodes the Cartan data. And then there was this realization of a Cartan data, this P coming with an action of G. So how do I encode that in this language? Well, that each realization, what it gives to me is a bundle map from the tangent bundle of P back to this trivial vector bundle A, 
which is given by this co-frame, theta, eta, the co-frame that was formed out of the connection one form and the tautological one form. And this covers the, the map H that I have from P to X, that it's part of, the, that it's the invariance in the end. Okay, so each realization is now encoded as such a bundle map. All right, so I put this data, I have encoded it, I have this realization, I think of it as such a bundle map. And the first thing that you note is that if you somehow know that there is a solution to the problem for any point in X, which means for any possible values of the invariant, then you check that this bracket that I define it, it's actually a Lie bracket. It satisfies the Jacobi identity. Okay? And that turns out to be quite important. And in fact, in all examples that I told you before, you can go there and check that the, bracket, the Lie bracket is satisfied. And in any relevant examples that you can, that you can find, the bracket will be a Lie bracket. So the, this Jacobi identity will be satisfied. So that is important because that will make this triple, this vector bundle, this bundle map, and this bracket, it's what's called a Lie algebraid which I will tell you a little bit later more what it is. And so these, these algebraids encode the Cartan problem, and the advantage of this point of view is that there is no more P in the picture. It's, it's abstracted in this geometric object, so you don't have to think that these theta and these eta are one forms on some manifold that you are still looking for, okay? So the Cartan data is encoded in, these, um, in this geometric way, and it makes perfect sense. But of course, uh, if we want to solve the classification problem, we have to find this realization. So we have to find these bundle maps that appear here. I'm just translating things in some, some language. So I didn't solve anything. All right. OK, so um, the other thing, of course, is I mean, we don't want just to show that these things exist. We want to study their symmetries. We want to describe the moduli space of solutions. Is it smooth? Is it singular? And so on. And it turns out that this, this approach provides, provides answers to, to all these questions. All right, so now I will, in the end, I will want to explain how to solve this problem using these. So for that, I'm going to have to give you a small crash course on what are these extended Lie theory, these Lie algebraids and these, their global versions which are called Lie groupoids. So that's the, the next part of the lecture. So a small crash course on Lie algebraids and Lie groupoids. So first of all, what is a Lie algebraid? So it's a vector bundle. It comes with two things, a bracket on the sections and a bundle map back to the tangent bundle to, X, to the base. And it's, these are supposed to be compatible in the, in the, uh, in the following sense. So the, this Leibniz identity that I wrote before holds. So if I take two sections and multiply one of them by a function, I can take it out at the expense of differentiating the function by this vector field obtained from the first section by applying the anchor. And then the Jacobi identity has to be satisfied, so this is indeed a Lie bracket, so there's a bit of repetition there. Now, very simple examples of these are the following. So, of course, if, the, if I take the tangent bundle to, to a manifold, that always gives me a Lie algebraid in a very trivial way. The sections of these are just vector fields, so I have the usual Lie bracket of vector fields, and the anchor in this case is the identity, and then you recognize these as a very simple identity for the ordinary Lie bracket of vector fields. At the, at the, the, this is one extreme. At the opposite extreme, I can take the base to be a point, and then all the differential geometry disappears, and what I have is just a Lie bracket on the vector space G. So I have a Lie algebra. So these are two extreme cases of this Lie algebra. And, uh, uh, and a somewhat intermediate case is if you take uh, an infinitesimal action of a Lie algebra on some manifold X, you can define an algebra structure on the trivial bundle with fiber, the Lie algebra, by declaring that on constant sections, 
the bracket is just the bracket, the bracket on G, and defining the anchor to be the, action, the infinitesimal action. Okay? So these are just very simple examples uh, where uh, you can use them as test cases for various things. Uh, so one, one simple thing is that these algebras, they come with two things. They come with orbits. And that's because if you look at the image of this bundle map, you get a distribution in, the, in X. The distribution has varying rank, but still it's integral. So it has leaves, and the leaves are called the orbits of A. And the other thing that also appears uh, is if you look, instead of looking at the image, you look at the anchor at the kernel of this map, the kernel of the anchor at the point, and the kernel, because of this property at, at the point, becomes a Lie algebra. So at each point, you have a different Lie algebra, which is called the isotropy Lie algebra. And so if you go like to, the, to this infinitesimal action algebra, you will see that these orbits are nothing but the orbits of the action, and the isotropies are nothing but the isotropies of the action. And that's the reason why I mentioned this elementary example. In the tangent bundle, there is only one orbit. There is the isotropy is trivial. In the case of Lie algebra, there is only one orbit, which is the point, and the isotropy is just the Lie algebra G. All right. Now, we are interested in more serious examples of algebraids. So here is the algebraid associated with the bochner kähler metric. So the base, the, the manifold where this algebraid leaves is these manifolds where the invariants take values. The, the algebraid is the trivial bundle with fiber Cn plus Un. And then the Lie bracket on constant sections is given by this formula, which I gave you before. So here is the previous expression of the curvature, which I didn't even finish because it extends. And then there is the anchor map. So that's the, the type of algebraid that we are looking at when we are looking at this Cartan problem for bochner kähler And uh, whenever I have a bochner kähler manifold, the associated UN structure gives me this vector bundle map, which actually is more than just a vector bundle map, is a Lie algebraid map. So remember, I just told you the tangent bundle is a Lie algebraid, so I'm saying that this is a, a map from the tangent bundle algebraid to this algebraid, this bochner kähler algebraid. And so somehow the problem is I have this A, which is given here, and I have to find these things. This is the problem. Okay, okay so to, to solve that problem, what we are going to do is we're going to make this thing into a global object. Okay, this thing is an infinitesimal object. We're going to make this into a global object. So what is the object corresponding to this Lie algebraid? Well, it has to be called a Lie groupoid, of course, right? So what is that? So, well, the, the example, the, the most basic example to keep in mind is to think when you have a topological space and we look at paths, not loops, paths, model homotopy, right? So there is a homotopy, two, two paths that are, which are homotopic, and there is a path which is not homotopic. And so what I'm saying is we look at paths, and I'm parameterizing paths by the interval 0, 1, fixing the parameterization. And I think of a homotopy class of such a path as an arrow that starts at the initial point of the path and at the final point of the path. And these things have some structure. So of course it has a source and a target map, which is just, I, to this arrow I have the source and the target. And um, I can compose them whenever two such things match. And the point is that if I take paths and I concatenate them, the homotopy class of the concatenation only depends on the homotopy classes of the paths I started with. So this is a well-defined operation on the set of homotopy classes of paths. Uh, furthermore, for each point of my, manif of my topological space X, I have the trivial constant path based at that point. And so that gives me what's called an identity arrow at x. So x is somehow is embedded into this space of paths through this identity map. And it is an identity map in the sense that under the previous multiplication, if I compose with an identity, I don't do anything. Right? 
And there is also an inverse, which is just, I take a path, and I take the, op the opposite path by running the parameterization in the opposite way. And clearly, if I compose two such things, what I get is the identities either at the source or at the target. Okay? So this is an example of a, a simple example of a, of a groupoid. And it turns out that uh, this space is more than just a space. It has a natural topology. So this is a topological space. And then source, target, multiplication, and inverse are all continuous maps. So this is an example of a topological groupoid. If you require not just to have a topological space but a manifold, then this thing is also a manifold of twice the dimension of x. And these maps, they all become smooth maps. Uh, the target and the source become submersion. The inversion becomes a diffeomorphism, and, uh, and so on. And the unit is an embedding. So this thing, this space of paths on this manifold model homotopy is an example of a Lie groupoid. Groupoid in the smooth category. So in general, a Lie groupoid is just two manifolds with a pair of maps, a pair of submersions, the source and the target. And uh, we have a partial composition. So in the sense that if I have two arrows, I will compose them if they match. And the composition gives me some product. There is some identity for each point in X, which has the identity property. And there is an inverse, uh, which has the inverse property. OK. So here are some very simple examples of Lie groupoids. So I just gave you one, which was this fundamental groupoid of a, of a manifold. Is another one, if I take just a pair groupoid and I think of a pair of points as just an arrow from the first element in the pair to the second element in the pair. That's just, there is an obvious composition. And uh, that's, that's an example of a Lie groupoid. Uh, in some sense, is an X. Uh, so I was saying that if X is just a point, then this notion just becomes the usual notion of a Lie group. And uh, if I have an action of a group on a manifold, I can, build, I can make that into a groupoid, called the action groupoid, because I can think of such a pair as an arrow. So if I have a, 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 a pair given by an element, so the product will be uh, an arrow which has source, the source of tau, and target, the target of gamma. So it will lie there on the intersection of the source and target. This picture is a bit misleading because these things don't have to intersect transversally or anything. They could, they could be equal, for example. All right, but now I'm saying that we have these uh, algebra associated with it. So the vector bundle is going to be taking the tangent to the source fibers along the identity section. So I took the tangent to the green things along x. And that forms a, a vector bundle over x. So that's the, the algebraid. And uh, then I have this bundle map from A to Tx, so the anchor. Well, I used here the source, so now I use the target. I take the differential, and I restrict to these, and I will get a bundle map from these back to Tx. So that's my anchor. And finally, I have the Lie bracket, and that should follow more or less the same construction as in a Lie group. So the first thing to realize is that sections of this thing, so let's see, that was the, the anchor. And now, to define the bracket, let's look at sections of A. Well, if I have a vector tangent at one fiber, and I do right translation by tau, I will get a vector tangent to the green, to the source fiber, but at that point. But now if I start varying my tau, I will get a bunch of tangent vectors along these blue tangent to the green lines. And that was from a single vector. So from a single vector, I, bought, I got all those tangent vectors along these green lines. So if instead of taking a single vector, I take a vector at each point of x, so a section of A, and I do right translations, this will propagate to a vector field on my group on my G, on the total space of my groupoid, which is tangent to the green lines and which is right invariant because I use these right invariant, tra these uh, right translations to build it. 
So that's, so a section of A gives rise to such a right invariant vector field and the converse is also true. If I start with a right invariant vector field, I can restrict it along X and that gives me a section of A and this, this is a bijection. So there is an identification between sections of A and right invariant vector fields on G. Therefore, I can define the bracket of two sections by extending them to right invariant vector fields, take the usual bracket, and then restrict to the identity section. And that defines a Lie bracket on the sections. And you can check that, so that, that's a Lie bracket because we had a Lie bracket on vector fields, and you can check the Leibniz identity for this map rho by using some standard property of Lie brackets. So that's how you build out of a groupoid, how you build the algebraoid. Well, now you can go to these very basic examples and check what is the algebraoid, say, of the fundamental groupoid. And the answer is, what is the algebraoid of the fundamental groupoid? For no one. <laughs> There are some people in the audience who work in the subject, they know the answer. So it's just the tangent bundle to X. So the, the fundamental groupoid integrates the tangent bundle to X. Now the pair groupoid that I also had before there also has algebraic the tangent bundle to X. But that's just the usual thing that if I have a Lie algebra, there can be several Lie groups integrating them, right? Uh, also for the action groupoid or for the Lie group, I, I recover the usual construction of the Lie algebra of the Lie group, and for the action groupoid, I will get the action algebraoid that I wrote before. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh. So now you can ask if these basic theorems of Lie theory that we study when we do a course in Lie theory, if they hold. And the, the, the story starts nicely. So Lee's first theorem, if I have a source connected Lee groupoid G, so here what in the Lee theory you typically require the group to be connected or to be simply connected, that's replaced here by the source fibers being connected or the source fibers being simply connected. Okay? It doesn't matter if you take source or target because they are diffeomorphic V inversion. But so given a source-connected Lie groupoid, there is a unique source-simply-connected Lie groupoid, which has the same Lie algebraoid, and which is a covering of the groupoid you started with. Okay, just like for Lie groups. Given a Lie group, there is a unique connected Lie group, there is a unique simply-connected Lie group covering it with the same Lie algebra. For Lie sec second theorem is the integration of morphism. So I didn't say what is a morphism of Lie algebra. You can try to guess what it is. Um, but so if I start with a Lie groupoid G1, a Lie groupoid G2, with algebra A1 and A2, and I assume the first one is source simply connected, then any algebra morphism from A1 to A2 integrates to a unique groupoid morphism from G1 and G2. So Lee's second theorem also goes through nicely. And uh, the problem, and what makes actually the theory interesting, is that Lee's first theorem is not true. It's not true that every Lie algebraoid comes from a Lie groupoid. So that was a long, uh, a problem that was open for many years, and then eventually it was solved. And nowadays, we understand completely the obstructions to integrate an algebraoid to a groupoid. So there is a, a way to to decide, if I give you an algebraoid, whether it comes from a groupoid or not. All right, can anyone see this? <laughs> no, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what is a Moret Cartin form on a Lie group, right? It's a G valued one form, which is right invariant, left invariant, whatever convention you take. So what I'm writing there is that there is, on a groupoid, there is a moret cartin one form. And it's just given by the same formula. But now it's just a little bit more complicated because the problem is that you want to use right translations. Right translations are not always defined. So this moret cartin form doesn't apply to any tangent vector to the groupoid. It only applies to vectors that are tangent to the source fibers. But so there is a notion of a moret cartin form. So it's a source foliated one form with values in the Lie algebraoid. 
It's just the analog for Oli Group. Okay, this I hope people can see a little bit better. <laughs> so what is, what is the point of this result? Suppose that our algebroid is trivial as a vector bundle. And remember, those are the kind of algebroids that appear in connection with those classification problems. They were always trivial as vector bundles. And that's an important thing. Then what I say is that if I have some groupoid integrating this algebroid, and I restrict the moray cartan form to a single source fiber, what that gives me is a Lie algebroid map from the tangent of that source fiber to A that covers the target map. So this should remind you of this realization as a vector bundle map, which comes with some co-frame and some map to the algebra. And moreover, these, these things, they are universal. These morphisms, they are universal. In what sense? In the sense that if I start with a manifold with a co-frame, which induces an algebraic map from the tangent bundle to A, it is basically of this form. So it's locally isomorphic to this. So these are universal. Okay? So this means that if you are interested in finding co-frames that have this property that map to this A, they will, you can find them by finding integrations of A and finding source fibers with the restriction of the moray cartan one form. And that's the basic idea behind how to solve this Cartan problem. All right, but now let's go back to G structures. So this thing that I just told you was about co-frames. And when we have G structures, our co-frames are a bit special because they were made out of a connection one form and this tautological one form, right? So they're just not arbitrary co-frames. So these uh, algebraids associated with G structures, they have a bit more structure that one has to use. And so the, really the thing that you, that, you, that you have to keep in mind is that this co-frame has this special form that I just told you. It's made out of a connection one form and this tautological one form. Now, from now on, just to make things a little bit, to, to, to tell you true statements, I will assume G compact. But that's not really very, very important. So back to our Cartan data. So I told you Cartan data can be encoded as these bundles. So here is the, again, the, what I told you before, except that now you know what is an algebroid. And so I have abstracted this to a definition. So a lead G algebroid is just an algebroid who's trivial as a vector bundle. The fiber is Rn plus some Lie algebra G, plus the Lie algebra G. G is the fixed group. Note that X is a G manifold. And this algebroid has a, an, a, a, an anchor which is given by an equivariant map plus the infinitesimal action associated with this G manifold. And the bracket on constant section has to take this special form for some G equivariant maps C and R. Right? And now I don't even need to assume that this was coming from some G structure as I did before. I can just make this as a definition. Anyway, uh, and then I will say that the G realization is just a manifold with a locally free proper G action together with an equivariant Lie algebraic map to A. And that map will necessarily be of this form where this is a co-frame. So back to our problem, the problem is really, I, ga I gave you this A, I have to find these G realizations. But now I know from what I told you just one slide before that you can do that by looking at the integrations of A, taking source fibers and restricting the moray cartan one form. So to do that in this scenario, we have to be a little bit more careful because we want these things to come with an action of G. So we don't want just to have some manifold with some algebra map to A. We want that this thing comes with a Lie algebra with a Lie group action. So if I start with such a Lie groupoid, we have automatically from its definition this inclusion of 
the action group, the infinitesimal action algebra on A, which is just taking uh, an element in the Lie algebra, including the factor. Remember, A was a trivial vector bundle, Rn plus G. So I'm just taking the part in G. And that turns out is a, it's just an injective Lie algebraic morphism. And so what really we need is what we call a Lie, a Lie G groupoid, which is just a, a groupoid whose algebra is a Lie G algebra, and for which we have a groupoid morphism from the action groupoid of G on X into my groupoid G, which integrates this map. Okay. So again, this is because I want to get the solutions manifolds with actions of G. So, in fact, if we look at this morphism, it defines a G action on G by simply, so if I take an element here, gamma cross G, this, this is switch, this should be G cross gamma, whatever. And if I include it in G, I get an arrow. And then I can take right translation or left translation by that arrow. And that gives me a right G action on G. And this uh, right G action has the following properties. It makes the target a gene variant map. It acts along the source fibers. So each source fiber becomes a G manifold. And it is proper because I'm assuming G compact. And it's locally free because this thing was injective. So in particular, if I look at the source fiber of such a Lie G groupoid, it's a principal G bundle over this quotient, which is now a Norbifold because the action is only locally free. So somehow, if I start with a Lie algebra, I integrate to a Lie G groupoid, I will get these Orbifolds solutions somehow. So here is the, the basic theorem that allows to solve these classification problems. So if I start with a Lie G groupoid integrating a Lie G algebra, each source fiber equipped with the restriction of the Maurice Cartan one form gives me a solution. So it gives me a manifold with an action of G, which becomes a G structure over the quotient, over the orbifold. And that satisfies my structure equations that define my Lie G algebra. And this thing is universal in the sense that any solution is going to be isomorphic to one such solution, at least up to cover. So you are guaranteed that all solutions will appear in this way somehow. So if you go back now to the bochner keller situation, here is what you conclude. Because the algebra that you have there, it is indeed an algebra, it satisfies the Jacobi identity. For any value that you pick of these invariants S, T, and U, you are guaranteed that there will exist a bochner keller orbifold which satisfies the, the equations and which takes this value at some point. Okay? Now, there is something going on here because I assumed here that there was a Lie G groupoid integrating this Lie algebra. So I'm cheating a little bit. So here is the cheating that it's going on first. I actually don't need to integrate the algebra to the groupoid. I only need to restrict the algebra to an orbit and then integrate the restriction to an orbit. The second thing is I don't really need to find global integrations. I don't need to really find Lie groupoids. I only need to find local Lie groupoids, whatever that means. So there is some cheating going on, but basically the, the idea is that. So there is some technicalities involved. In any way, that, that can be used to prove, to prove this corollary. Now, a couple of remarks. So usually we're not, we, we are interested in solutions that may have special properties. So for example, we like to have complete solutions. Now to, to use this formalism to find complete solutions, it depends really not just having local G integrations, but in having G integrations. 
And that doesn't happen always. But still, we can decide by looking at A, whether that happens or not. So there is an obstruction theory that builds on this obstruction theory that I told you that was used to solve Lee's first theorem for algebroids. There is an obstruction theory that it's more refined, that it's for these Lee G algebroids, that allow us to understand whether there are or not G integrations, and therefore whether there are or not complete solutions. So complete Buchner Keller matrix in that case. Of course, if you don't integrate, you will never find explicit solutions. If you really want to find explicit solutions, you have to find explicit integrations. Now, I'm not claiming that that's easy. However, it turns out that in the case of the bochner kaler matrix, it is possible to find integra global integrations. But that's a different story. Okay? And, I mean, in the end, of course, I mean, this has nothing to do with the specific situation of bochner kaler So if I looked at this matrix of Hessian type, the same story that I just said holds. Okay? For each values of the invariance, there is a solution, a, law, a germ of a solution, if you want. And you can decide whether there are global complete solutions or not. So let's look at it. So here is the, remember the original problem for metrics of Hessian type is you have a surface and you have a metric whose Gaussian curvature satisfies this equation. And uh, so making the differential analysis, the structure equations that you get are these. So K1 and K2 are the principal curvatures. Uh, and I'm using the same notation. So theta is the tautological one form. Eta is the connection one form. And so here the curvature appears there. And now we make this into these Lie-G algebraids. Remember, that was just a, a different way of encoding the structure equations. So there is the bracket, and here is the anchor. Okay, so there are three invariants. The bases are three. The fiber is SO2 plus R2. And so the, the fiber is, is also R3, and these give you the bracket, and these give you the anchor. It's a pretty straightforward thing. Okay, so now what we have to do to find these surfaces? We have to integrate this thing or at least decide if it has integrations or not, and so on. So, as I said, you don't really have to integrate the whole thing. You have to look at the orbits and ask yourself if the restriction to an orbit is integrable. So maybe I should have mentioned that before. It's very possible that an algebraid has a restriction to every orbit integrable and not being integrable. Okay. Anyway, so... In this case, it's very easy to understand, and that's why I, I chose this as a, a, an illustration. So the orbit foliation of this algebroid is given by the level set of this function. So here is a picture. So in this picture, I have k1, k2, and I, sh I, I shifted the, the curvature by 1. And um, so the, the level sets of these are, are described here. So we have these spheres, and then we have these... Uh, surfaces of revolution, and um, what do we see? So there are two points here, which is this point and this point, which are points where the anchor is zero. So these are orbits of dimension zero. Now, if you have a, an orbit of dimension zero and you go through the theory, what that means is that the source fiber at that point is just a Lie group. So that the restriction of the, of the algebra to that point is obviously integral. It's just a Lie algebra, and it just gets a Lie group. And so these things correspond to solutions whose principal bundle is a Lie group. Okay? And so what are, what are, what are those? Well, one is going to be uh, uh, a metric of constant curvature, positive constant curvature, and the other one is going to be a metric of negative constant curvature. So those are those two points. And now you have to analyze what happens with, these, uh, with the other leaves. So it turns out from this obstruction theory that if the leaves have trivial pi 2, there is no problem. The thing is always integrable. So that's an example of how powerful the obstruction theory is. You don't have to do anything. 
Just have to look at pi 2 of the leaf. It's trivial. Fine. Don't have to worry. So you are guaranteed that over these, for these values, there will be solutions, and there will be complete solutions, at least orbifold solutions. Okay? Now you can discuss whether they are smooth or orbifold, but at least there will be orbifold solutions. For the spheres, the pi 2 is not trivial, and you have to compute the obstructions. So there is a recipe to compute the obstructions, and the obstructions tell you that not every sphere is actually integral. It will oscillate by spheres, and it, it, it's a behavior like rational, irrational. So there will be like rational spheres where the thing is integrable, and the irrational spheres where the thing is not integrable. Okay. And so you know that for points in this region, the, there will be solution, there will be metrics of Hessian, of Hessian um, type if you are in good spheres, and there will be me metrics of there won't exist any metrics of Hessian types if you are in bad spheres. Okay. And then there are, I mean, there are two surfaces here, limit surfaces, which also don't have pi 2, so the analysis, it's, it's also okay. There is no problem. Now, uh, what I don't, what I'm not going to explain, because that that's, would be really like at least another lecture, is doing this analysis for the bochner kaler uh, example. Because the algebra is, so, is complicated. And then you have to understand these foliations of the, of the algebraoid, you have to go through the analysis to see what happens for each leaf and so on. But what I'm, what I'm telling you is that this can be done. Okay? And uh, you, you, you recover. So this paper of Bryant that I mentioned at the beginning has, I don't know, 120 pages. And uh, most of the things that, that he does that is done in a, in a quite ad hoc way um, with some ad hoc arguments. And by, by using this formalism, you can reduce this from 120 pages to maybe 15 or 20 pages. Okay? And you can actually improve them. So why can you improve them? Well, you can improve them because you can decide explicitly for which things, things exist or don't exist. That's one thing. The other thing you can improve, and it's a story that I didn't tell you about. So I didn't tell you about symmetries. And you can use this algebra to detect what are exactly the symmetries of the solutions. But you can also use this algebraoid and this groupoid formalism to understand the moduli space of solutions, to understand if the moduli space is singular or not, and if it's singular, what kind of singularities it has. Okay? And so you can, all, you can do all that in a systematic way using this, this formalism. All right. Um, just some closing. Am I okay? I'm, I'm running. I'm, I, I'm over time, right? All right, so this is the last slide. So this was just a comment that I just made. Uh, I told you that at some point I assume G compact. Really what's important is that the kind of families of G structures that you are dealing is what's called G structures of finite type. So after some prolongation, the thing stops. Um, and so the, the, the analysis is more or less similar, but the a bit more complicated because you have to work on these prolongations. And uh, just to, to close with an open problem, in many examples, including the case of bochner kaler another example you can treat with this formula is, is uh, uh, symplectic connections um, with special allonomy. The algebraids that appear there, they are related with another geometry, which is called Poisson geometry. So they are cotangent bundles of Poisson manifolds, whatever that means. And uh, because of that, symplectic geometry comes into the picture. And uh, I don't understand, and it's, it's, it's an open problem to understand why that is the case, why these algebraids come from these things. And um, I'm really curious to, to, to know what, what's the answer to, to that question. It should clarify quite a few things. OK, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Can you talk a bit about this very last point? Well, you mentioned these, the algebra is related to uh, the issue of connections with special holonomy. Can you, can you expand a bit on how this goes? What's
uh, sorry, symplectic connection special allotomy, they were uh, discussed by Merkulov and Schwarzhofer uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, they basically have a classification into four different types. One of the types turns out to be bochner kaler <laughs> And um, they also discuss, uh, they, they go also through a classification similar to what uh, Bryant does in his paper, uh, again, using some ad hoc methods. But I already there they mentioned that uh, the, the solutions can be found by what, using what's called some symplectic realizations of Poisson manifolds. So by finding some symplectic manifolds that somehow desingularize Poisson manifolds. Now, what is really happening is that underneath the algebraoid that describes the, that classification problem, this kind of Lie G algebraoid that I told you about, those are the cotangent bundles, or more precise, they are obtained from the cotangent bundle of a Poisson manifold. The cotangent bundle of a Poisson manifold has a canonical Lie algebraoid structure. And in those examples, they are, all, they are all obtained from some restriction procedure from such an early algebraoid. And because of that, when a, these algebraoids that come from, from Poisson manifolds, they integrate to groupoids which are symplectic groupoids. The groupoids have a symplectic structure. And that symplectic structure plays a role in, for example, in the, describing the moduli space of solutions and so on. Okay. But it's not at all clear why that is the case. It's just like, oh, here is, the, here is the, the structure equations. Here is the associated algebra. Oh, there is, it comes from a, a Poisson manifold. Why? And this Poisson manifold, I mean, it's a long story. This Poisson manifold comes from two gradable Lie algebras and whatever. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you.